Good morning. Welcome to Hope Church. And uh, I'm going through, we're going through a series right now. We're talking about the stories of Jesus. And one of the things in, that we learn is that God really wants us to know that there's two really fundamental relationships that are absolutely critical for every human being. Number one, our relationship with God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, with, with all your strength, right? And then the second one is love your neighbor as yourself. And so these two relationships are so incredibly important as human beings. And they have to be maintained. And that's the hard part. The maintenance, maintain, maintenance of these relationships is, is a challenge, right? And one of the biggest challenges is the area in the area of forgiveness. Forgiveness is one of those things that, man, it's easy to talk about, but it's hard to do, right? And if you've been harmed, if you've been hurt by other people, that's where the rubber meets the road. That's where you have to come to a place and say, am I going to forgive this person or am I going to hold it in? Am I going to try to seek revenge and different things like that? So the passage we're going to look at today in the book of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew is about this idea of forgiveness because Peter's going to come with a question and it's a good question. But let's talk just for a minute, kind of big picture things about forgiveness. One of the things that we hear Jesus saying over and over is forgiveness is not an option. It is necessary. It is critical. It is a command for a follower of Jesus Christ. You don't get to say, well, I don't feel like it, or you don't know what they did. You have to forgive. Secondly, forgiveness isn't the same as reconciliation. Sometimes we think that when I forgive a person, that means that we're going to still be in a good relate. We're going to be in a good relationship now, and you know that that's probably not true many times. And sometimes it's not possible, and sometimes it's not a good idea. We're going to talk more about that. The other thing I want you to know about forgiveness is forgiveness is a skill we learn. It's not some, you know, we should be better and learn and grow in the area of forgiveness. It's not something that we automatically are good at. And just because we're a follower of Jesus Christ, all of a sudden now we're, we're good at forgiving. It's a skill we have to grow in. And then today we're going to learn from the passage that forgiveness has no limits. And that's, that's the question that Peter has, isn't it? He asked Jesus, well, how many times, how many times do I have to forgive my brothers or sister who offends me? And that's found in Matthew chapter 18, verses 21. We're going to read starting at verse 21. And whether you're here in house or online, hi, join us, get your Bible. And let me read through this passage and let's talk about it. Because it's really Jesus talking to us about something that's really important in our relationship. Something we, something we all struggle with. Something we all need to grow in. And... Um, we're going to look at that this morning. So Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Seven times, up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. And then he goes on to tell the story. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. Okay. Now, let's just stop for a minute. Imagine yourself that you are in debt to a bank for a million dollars. Because I think that's something we can pretty much, we could say, I know how, that would, maybe some of you going, yeah, that's me. How'd you know? <laughs> but let's just say that you have this huge debt. It's a thousand dollars. And you have no way of paying it off. I mean, none. And you go into the bank with your head down and you have no plan. You, right now, your finances are hand to mouth. You just, there's no conceivable way you could pay that debt. You go into the bank and the bank says, listen, this is your lucky day. We as a bank have a policy that we forgive debts 
and your name randomly came up and we're going to forgive your whole debt. And you go, wait a minute. Do you know that I owe your bank a million dollars? Yeah, we know that. And we're taking the hit on that one. How would you walk out of the bank that day? You'd have a step, you know, spring in your step, be whistling, you know. It's like, hey, what a great day. Hey, you know, I mean, you would be like all over it, right? So this is how this guy should have left, right? He doesn't. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and he began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow uh, servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. There is a bunch of people around that kind of knew what was going on in this man's life, the debt he was forgiven, and he saw, they saw immediately what he did. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged, and they went and told the master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all your debt, uh, all that debt of yours, and be, because you begged me to, should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant, just as I had on you. In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. And then Jesus says this to close out that thought. This is how your heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. All right, well, let's unlock the parable, right? Peter's question's a good one. Um, I can forgive my brother and I, or sister, and I know I should, but how many times do I have to do it? So you kind of wonder why Peter's asking that question, right? Is it one of the disciples like bugging him, or is it somebody in his family? Uh, who is? Well, why does he bring this up? But he brings it up, and Jesus basically goes in and tells the story. So the question is, how much was the debt? that this servant owed the king, all right? How much was his debt? So I've kind of done some uh, research and I've done a little work, and it's interesting. There's two things about this parable. First, the man who owned the king uh, a debt, he owed in talents, okay? The man who owed the, 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 uh, you know, the wicked servant, you know, he came out and grabbed him by the neck. He, they, they, they call that, that's not, a, that's not the same uh, amount of money. But let's just start with the king. So he owed the king 10,000 talents, okay? So one talent is equal to 75 pounds. All right, we're bringing it into our day. So seven, that's, so is that, if you multiply that, 75,000 pounds, okay, of gold. Now, the current price of gold today, well, it was a couple days ago, is, was $29,000 a pound. So if you multiply that, it comes out to, for those of you that are good at math, about $21.75 billion. You get the point? You get the point. He had quite the debt, right? Um, the point that Jesus is making, this is a debt he could never have paid, This was beyond his scope. He could never pay it back. It was incredible. This is the GNP of some small countries in our world today. This is what he owed. And what did the king do? Well, first he pleaded, and his words were, be patient with me. Be patient with me. Some versions you may have show mercy on me. Have mercy on me, right? Well, how did he respond? If you had left the bank knowing that you had been forgiven a million dollar debt, would you walk out with a spring in your step? If somebody walked up, if your friend walked up to you and said, hey, you know, I owe you 20 bucks. Uh, I don't think I can get it to you this week. You go, forget it. Don't worry about it. No, no big deal. <laughs> Let's just call it even, right? Wouldn't, you, wouldn't that be your response? Instead, what does he do? He grabs the first guy that he sees owes him money. And he says, pay up now. Grabs him by the neck. 
I mean, picture that, right? He's forgotten something. Now, the question is, how much did the guy owe him, right? Well, we figured that out too. So he owed 100 denarius. So a denarius, 100 denarius is about 400 grams, okay? So 400 grams is 0.88 pounds. It's not even a pound, okay? It's not a pound, all right? And we're not talking about gold, we're talking about silver. All right. Now, how much was that in today's market? Well, it comes out to be $247. <laughs> you get it? $247. And what was the other number? $21.75 billion. It's, it's really like a million dollars versus a penny, really. It's what it comes to. It's even more than that. The point Jesus is making is this guy had an insurmountable debt. They would never pay it back. There's no way he could pay it back. And the king, he says, show mercy, have mercy on me. And he does. The king eats the debt. And then he finds the first person who owes him money. He grabs him by the neck. He owes him a penny. And he throws him in jail. Well, what's the point of the parable? Oh, by the way, notice that the man, he grabs him by the neck, and the man who's been, you know, he, says, he, says, he says, be patient with me. Do you know what? The exact same words that he had previously just said to the king. Same, same exact words. He says to the king, be patient with me. Now he's holding the guy who's saying, be patient with me. And what does he do? Throw him in jail. Jesus says this, this is how your heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from the heart. Now, another thing I've noticed, and there's, a, there's all this debate about what's the best type of teaching and preaching, and, and um, should it be this kind or this kind or this kind? And all I can say is that's not what Jesus did. Jesus basically answered questions with stories, with parables and stuff used illustrations and he just kind of walked away. In other words, what I'm saying is this oftentimes, and again, I'm not saying that the way that we are opening God's word and teaching and preaching today is wrong. There are some that say there's only one right way to do it and it needs to be this, this style. And, and I'm going, but Jesus didn't do that style. Jesus communicated truth. What I do know is that Jesus would never have done a sermon of, he, he, I can't find in the New Testament where Jesus does a sermon of three, three motivating factors and how to forgive. He just said, forgive, now let's move on, do it. You know, like he didn't say, here's three good reasons to forgive. Jesus said, okay, who, who should forgive? Do it. How many times? Well, here's, here's the story. Now do it. <laughs> that's that's kind of Jesus' model. He, he didn't do a lot of that other stuff. But, you know, I understand why we're, we're motivating and trying to encourage. And so what I'm going to tell you now is there are some lessons here that we should learn from this. So let's pick it apart a little bit and talk about those. Here's the first one. For, forgiveness is not an option. For, this, this story clearly tells us that if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you're a Christian, forgiveness isn't an option. It isn't in debate. It is mandatory that we must never get tired of forgiving, of repenting, of repairing our relationships. Because relationships will fail, and they need to be repaired. And we need to have to take, do the hard work of trying to seek reconciliation and forgiveness, and we need to seek all of those things. But we can always forgive no matter what. That's the point. Jesus is saying you can forgive no matter what. And it's not how many times, it's just just forgive, just forgive. Forgiveness is generally granted. And here's the thing, what I found, and, and this is what we struggle with. This, this is where the rubber meets the road. We, and I don't know about you, but I struggle because we often think, I don't feel like it. I'm angry, I'm upset. 
And here's the thing, forgiveness is generally granted before it's felt. We want forgiveness to be one of those things where we immediately feel like better. And sometimes you do, but oftentimes you don't. Right? And I've had people come to me and I've talked to people and they say, Pastor, I don't know whether I've really forgiven this person. I did forgive them. I've asked God to help me to forgive them, but I still have anger. I still have frustration. I still am upset when I hear their name, when I see them. I just get this visceral feeling in me and I don't think I've forgiven them because I have these bad feelings about them. And I want you to know that your forgiveness isn't based upon your feelings. It's an act of your will. Uh, I love this C.S. Lewis quote. Let me tell you, show you this. And Lewis is essentially telling us that forgiveness is hard work that will be very emotional, but we have to continually choose to do it. Look at what he says. He says, last week at Wallet Prayer, I suddenly discovered or felt as if I did that I had really, uh, that I had really forgiven somebody that I had been, I had, let me try that again. I suddenly discovered or felt as if I did that I had really forgiven someone that I had been trying to forgive over, for over 30 years, trying and praying that I might. In other words, what he's saying is, I finally, after 30 years, came to a place where my feelings felt like I forgave them. But for 30 years, I struggled. When I heard their name, when I saw them, that didn't mean he hadn't forgiven. It just meant the feelings hadn't been processed yet. But forgiveness is an act of the will. And after time, usually your feelings will change. Here's what I found. Letting a person who has hurt you off the hook really sets you free. And I think this is really important because we often think that the minute I forgive this person, I'm letting them off the hook and they're not going to get what's coming to them. And have you ever prayed this prayer? I'm just, just, let's just put a pause. Have you ever pray, prayed a prayer for bad things and disaster to happen to people who have harmed you? Do you think that's a good prayer? Lord, smite them. <laughs> right? I mean, do you really think that's a good prayer? But I mean, I understand you're frustrated, you're angry, and you say, Lord, strike them dead, you know? It's like, I don't know if that's a good prayer. I kind of think it isn't. I kind of think in the context of forgiveness, that's probably not. A, now, you may have to work through your prayer language, <laughs> but that may not be the, good, the best one. Uh, the, the point I want you to see is forgiveness really isn't about the other person. It's about you. It's about taking the shackles of anger and frustration off your shoulders. And it's about saying, God, uh, I forgive this person for the harm, for the sin they committed against me, because I want to be free. And I don't want to carry that around. And I, I, I don't want my life to be dragged down by this thing. And uh, this is why I think in Colossians, Paul writes, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you have a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And so forgiveness, yeah, maybe it sets the other person free, but it sets, more importantly, it sets you free. And that's really important. Okay, number two, forgiveness always comes at a cost to someone. Forgiveness requires somebody to take the hit, to pay the debt, to experience the pain. Somebody is going to lose out, right? If you, in forgiveness, somebody has to pay. If there's a, there's a uh, trust violation, if there's a harm, if there's hurt, somebody is going to pay the price. Now think about this. The king took a hit of 20 mil, billion, billion dollars, okay, in our, he took a huge hit to forgive this servant because this servant could never pay him back, right? And so when there's harm, there's a debt which may never be paid back. Now, I want to stop for just a minute and I want you to think about this. There are people in your life, and if you're watching online, it may, I may be speaking to you. There are people in your life who have harmed you. They have said things, they have 
done things either physically or emotionally that have done deep harm and damage in your life. They have hurt you and they have harmed you deeply. It may be a parent. It may be a spouse. It may be your kid. But there is somebody in your life that has really harmed you. And you have struggled with that. You've carried that weight your whole life. And you can't, you, you can't bring yourself to forgive them because you feel like if I forgive them, I let them off the hook and, and um, I, can't, I can't do that. But here's the thing. We're not talking about reconciliation. Forgiveness really deals with one person, that's you. Reconciliation, you have to have two people there. And I want to tell you, there are some situations in your life where you will never be reconciled to someone who has harmed you and hurt you. Let me give you a, 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 a couple of illustrations. It may be that you were harmed by your parents, either physically or emotionally or whatever. You, you, they, they abused you. And, and, you want, and, and you're at a place where you can't be reconciled to them. Why? Because they're dead. What do you do? I've talked with people who have talked about trauma that they have gone through in their childhood. And they're still struggling with it today. They say, well, how do I process that? Because I can't talk with them. They're dead. And I say, here's what you do. You write out a letter. You say, dear mom and dad, I just want to express to you uh, the harm, the hurt that you did to me. And, and at the end, but I forgive you. They're never going to be able to say, oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. It was a bad time. You know, whatever, you know. It's not going to happen. And sometimes I say, go to the grave and read it. Process those emotions. Get them out. It may be that somebody has damaged or hurt your reputation. Well, what do you do then? They can apologize to you, but your reputation is still in the dumpster, right? What do you do now? You have to forgive. You're going to take the hit. You're going to pay for their sin. There's no way around it. There's no, there's no way they can take, take it back. There's no way they can fix it. You may be a person, and, and this is probably more where we, where we sit, maybe not, but somebody harms you, they do things, they say something, they, they harm you, they sin against you, and, and, and you, you go to them and you speak to them, because the Bible does say that you should go, you know, and talk to them and, and stuff. But you go to them and they go, tough luck, don't care, get over it. You're too sensitive, whatever. You're never going to get them to, you're ne that's where you start praying those smite prayers, isn't it? Right? Kill them, Lord, now. <laughs> no, no, but I mean, that, that's kind of what you do, right? I mean, that, here's the point. Forgiveness is really all about you. It's letting, and it's not letting the, it kind of is letting the other person off the hook, but it's letting you off the hook, and that's more important. And, and forgiveness means I'm going to take the hit. I'm going to absorb the loss. Forgiveness means I'm going to forego vengeance and retribution. I'm, God is going to take care of that. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to let God handle it. And you can pray that. Sometimes it's helpful to pray that. Lord, I'm not going to be the one to get vengeance. I'm not going to seek rep, uh, uh, retribution. I'm going to, th that is in your hands. I'm just giving it over to you. I'm giving this whole person over to you. And I trust that you're going to handle that. And you just let it go. But here's the thing. Many times forgiveness means you're going to have to suffer for another person's sins. But isn't that what Jesus did for us? Didn't he suffer for sins that weren't his own? And isn't that what he's calling us to do in forgiveness? Yeah, it is. I, I, I like the quote from Diedrich Bonhoeffer. He says this. He says, my brother's burden, which I must bear, is quite literally his sin. And the only way to bear that sin is by forgiving it in the power of the cross of Christ in which I now share. Forgiveness is the Christ-like suffering which is the Christian's duty to bear. If you're going to forgive, you're going to have to take on other people's sins against you. You're going to have to do it. But here's a good way to think about it. Just remember that that's what the king did to your debt. That's what Jesus did for your sin. Forgive, Paul says, as Christ 
forgave you, right? That's what this whole parable is all about. And that gets us to the last point, that forgiveness is impossible apart from the cross. Somebody has said, theoretically, forgiveness is wonderful. Realistically, it's nearly impossible. I think that's true. Here's the problem. The unmerciful servant failed to embrace, he failed to grasp his own forgiveness. He didn't stop and consider how much he had been forgiven. And I believe that you can't really forgive others until you see how much you've been forgiven. And then that's the key to forgiveness. If you can't forgive, you don't understand the cross. You don't. Here's, I think, the problem that we struggle with. I think within the Christian world, there are a lot of Christians who think there are some really bad people out there, and I'm not one of them. I'm not perfect. I have a little dings. I have a few rust spots. I have a few sins. But I mean, I've got to be honest with you. Jesus, he died for the really bad people. And kind of for me. Kind of. Do you have that attitude about it? Do you look at the cross and say, Yeah, that was good that he did it for them, but I don't really need it that much. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us falls short. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. I think we need to get a new vision of the debt that we owe Remember, maybe you don't remember this, maybe you don't know this, but in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah saw the Lord. He had a vision. And he saw the glory of God. He saw the glory of Almighty God. And he was like, his response was, wasn't, cool, wow, that's great. His response was, woe is me. I am such a sinner. I am so lost. I should be dead right now because my debt is so great. And God forgives him, brings forgiveness to him. And we haven't come to that woe is me moment, I think. Many of us have not come to that woe is me moment. The minute that, th- that this servant walked into the king and the king said, and he pleaded with him, please have mercy on me. And the king ate his debt. He took the hit because somebody has to take the hit. He should have walked out and said, woe is me. But he didn't. See, the unmerciful servant failed to embrace his own forgiveness and he didn't stop and consider how much he had been forgiven. And I don't believe you really can forgive others until you see how much you have been forgiven. The problem with your forgiveness is not the heinous thing that somebody did against you or the terrible things they said about you or the way they trashed your reputation or the way they raised you. That, that, those are terrible things, but here's the point. You are not looking at the right things. Until you see yourself beneath the cross... You don't have the basis to have the forgiveness that you need. You just don't have it. Until you view your sin and see your sorry state and see your hopeless state, until you see that, you don't have the, you don't have the, the basis for forgiveness. Show me a person that can't forgive, and I'll show you a person who hasn't gazed upon the cross recently. When you stand beneath the cross and you gaze up at Jesus hanging there on that tree for you, it has to break your heart. 
And I think the problem with our forgiveness recently or today is we haven't gazed upon the cross enough. We haven't seen our debt. Somebody has said there's no forgiveness without suffering, nails, thorns, and blood. Never. He paid a debt we couldn't know. He took the hit for us. He granted us mercy and forgiveness. Isaiah 1 says this, though your sins are scarlet, they will be white as wool. But that came at a cost, right? The point that Jesus is making is if you want mercy, you have to show mercy. But where do you find the capacity to show mercy? And the answer is by gazing at the cross, by seeing your debt, by rehearsing your forgiveness. And then you go out and somebody offends you or says something and you forgive them and you say, hey buddy, you're gonna have to do better than that. It's like a dime. The point is Christians who can't forgive have forgotten how much they've been forgiven. If you claim his forgiveness without forgetting uh, forgiving others, we show that we don't understand the depths of our sin and the purpose of the cross. How about you? How about you? One last final word. So when we get together Tuesday mornings as staff, first thing we do is we pray. If you put a prayer request in, you type prayer and you send it in, and that gets on the prayer list if it comes this weekend. We pray for those all during the week, but we focus our time uh, Tuesday morning. First thing, we pray for whatever requests come in that we're aware of. We pray for those as a staff. The last thing we do is whoever's teaching that weekend will sit down and share where they're going to go in the message. And so different people write the guides, the the study guides where our groups or individuals use them. And uh, you can get those online. And if you're part of a life group, those are the questions. And so when I, you know, this weekend I talked about where I was gonna go and I shared some stuff. So then whoever's writing the guide will, will put down questions so we can go a little deeper and spend a little more time and just kind of unpack this idea of forgiveness a little bit more. So that's how we do it, okay? So one of the things that happens is many times that something will come up in that discussion that I, that I go, oh, yeah, you know what? That should be in the message. This is one of those moments. So somebody brought up, and I thought it was a great, great observation. They said, we're really talking about one side of forgiveness. When somebody offends us, when somebody harms us, when somebody sins against us and how we're supposed to respond. And, and he said, what about the other side of the script? What about when we harm someone else? What about when we do something that harms or hurts or we sin against someone else? What about that? And I go, you're right. That's the other side of the script, isn't it? So do you have someone that you have harmed, that you have sinned against, that you, and it doesn't have to be this last week, it could be for, from years ago, that you've never taken ownership, you've never taken responsibility, you've never asked for forgiveness, you never confessed your sin, and what I mean by confession of sin, and I know I have to say it, and I'm sorry I have to say it, it's not this. I'm sorry that you felt the way you did, but you said this, so therefore you had it coming. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is taking complete ownership and saying, I did this, I sinned against you, I harmed you, and I want to make it right if I can, and it may, I may never be able to make it right, but I'm taking responsibility for it. I'm confessing my sin to you for how I harmed you. Is there somebody in your life you need to do that to? Do you need to ask them for their forgiveness? They may not give it to you. That's okay. Your job isn't to make them forgive you. Your job is to take ownership for your sin against them and confess it. You say, Matt, is there a passage of Scripture in there that would encourage me to do this? Good question. Let me read it to you. Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 
Jesus says, therefore, if you are offering your gift on the altar and there remember your brother and sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Jesus is saying, instead of just going through the motions of religion, relationships need to be king and you, they need to be maintained. Your relationship with your Father in heaven and your relationship with your brothers and sisters is vital and important and it, they need to be maintained. Instead of going through the motions of worship, make sure that those relationships are real. Because God isn't impressed with phony people approaching him. So there's work to be done, I think, in all of our lives, isn't there? There's the work of forgiveness, and maybe there's the work of repentance. Maybe there's the work of going to somebody and acknowledging our harming them. So what will it be? Jesus says, if you want mercy, you got to show it. You got to show it. If you want forgiveness, you got to give it. There, that's the sermon. <laughs> Those last two phrases. I spent a long time getting to that. <laughs> Jesus would have just told the story and said, now it goes to go do it. <laughs> Let's not debate about it. Let's not argue about it. Let's not explain it away. Let's just do it. Stand with me. Let's pray. Father, help us. Because without your help, without the power of your Holy Spirit, we can't do this. We need your help. We need to gaze upon the cross. We need to understand the immensity of our, our sin, our debt. That our debt wasn't small. It wasn't minor. It was insurmountable. It was beyond our reach. And only could it be paid when the Son of God came from heaven to earth and gave his precious life on a cross for us. He took our sin. He gave his life. He forgave our debt. Father, help us to leave the bank today rejoicing with a skip in our step. But help us to be ready for the first person that we are brought, that is brought to mind that owes us and the first person that harms us and let us be ready not to grab their necks but to forgive them their debt. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.